Our scripture reading this morning will be from the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 21 through 41. Hear now God's word. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go in to the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews, putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, If Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. May God bless the hearing and reading of his word this morning. Please be seated. Thank you, Joel. I'm going to step off stage for just a second because I'm going to try live streaming primarily for my wife who's at home with sick kids. So give me just a second. (laughs) Okay, she'll tell me how that works later. (laughs) All right, we're going to be in Acts 19, as we just read. Our title this morning is, When the Enemy Strikes. When the Enemy Strikes. This is one of those passages um, that is somewhat difficult to preach because it's a very narrative story, right? And you read through the story, and then you're like, there it is. That's what happened, right? Right? 
And as I thought about this, there, there's a couple of questions that I ask myself when I am considering a passage and I'm going to be teaching on it. And one of those questions is, why is it here? Why did God put this passage in the book of Acts? Why should we care? Right? Why should we care about this whole thing with uh, Diana or Artemis, depending on your translation? Right? Why is it a big deal? So hopefully... I have found why it's a big deal, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. When the enemy strikes, Acts chapter 19, verses 21 to 41. But we begin with prayer. Father, we come to your precious holy word, and we recognize and we acknowledge that the wisdom of man is insufficient to grasp the truths of your word. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are able to understand. And so this morning I ask that you would remove the distractions from our hearts and minds so that we can hear from your word and that your Holy Spirit can take that word and use it in our lives to make us more like Christ. And so Father, I ask that I would be just your tool, your instrument to be used to communicate the truth of your word to your people. We thank you and we praise you for what you have planned for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today is Palm Sunday, as we mentioned. It's the day when, uh, around 2,000 years ago, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He was hailed and celebrated as the coming king. And only days later, as we mentioned, those same adoring crowds were shouting for his death. The church is in a similar situation situations. For generations, the church has enjoyed a privileged, privileged status within the United States. Like Jesus riding in on his donkey, we've been celebrated and acclaimed. But today, voices that once lauded the church now call for its destruction. Today, voices that were saying that this was a good thing that our nation was a Christian nation are now saying, well, no, we, weren't, we never were. The church does not exist to be popular. I hope that that does not come as a surprise to you. The church does not exist to be popular. We are not meant to enjoy celebrity status in a culture of darkness. The church exists to point lost souls to Jesus Christ. The church exists to take new believers and grow them into mature saints. In the process of doing that, the church is going to face persecution. Persecution of the church always has its roots and motivation in Satan. He is the enemy. We have to understand that. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan is persecuting the church, and in his persecution of the church, he has a twofold goal, I believe. Goal number one, to prevent the spread of the gospel. That is always Satan's goal. And goal number two is to cripple the child of God. See, once we are saved, Satan cannot unsave us, but he can make us crippled and ineffective in our service for Christ. In chapter 19, Satan brings people in to cause a riot, and in this riot, he is trying to accomplish these two goals, and he's trying to do it by using fear and discouragement, and we're going to talk about that. Satan wants to give them, what he wants them to do is he wants them to give up. He wants them to believe he want that the difficulties and trials and struggles in our life are bigger than we can handle. That's what he wants us to believe. That they're more than we can bear. You know what? They are on our own. But we can bear them. We can endure them with Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. And so this morning we're going to be equipped to escape this attack of Satan by learning when and how he attacks. Knowing the tactics of the enemy will enable us to do battle more effectively. And as we are victorious in battle against our enemy, we are able to impact the world for Christ. So we first discover when Satan attacks. We're going to look at when he attacks and how he attacks. We're going to look at when he attacks. And from this passage, it teaches us that Satan attacks the vulnerable. Satan attacks the vulnerable. In 1 Peter 5 eight, Satan is described as a roaring lion okay, that walks about seeking whom he may devour. The thing about lions is that lions do not go after the most physically fit prey. 
A lion is going to go after prey that is sick, that is weak, that is young, or that is too old to get away. That is what a lion is going to do. Satan is like a lion and he wants to get us when we're vulnerable because he's smart, okay? And he's going to take the easy prey. And I would submit to you that all of us at one time or another have made ourselves easy prey for the enemy. Our passage this morning reveals two times in our lives when we are vulnerable and when we are aware of these, we are able to better fight this battle that we are in. The first area, without support, we are vulnerable. Without support, we are vulnerable. Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 21. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Paul has been ministering in Ephesus for over three years. The Lord has used Paul to heal sickness. He's cast out demons. The word of God is growing. This church is established. And now Paul has this burden to not only go to Jerusalem, but to continue on to Rome. This burden is given to him from his own spirit, but also from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and really what we're going to see from this point through the end of Acts, so for the next uh, eight chapters, is that g how Paul gets to Rome. Okay? He has this burden to get to Rome. He doesn't get there how he thought or how we might think. It's a very different path for Paul to get to Rome. But that's what the book deals with. So Paul has this determined focus. Okay? When we have purpose and direction, it is tempting for us to think that we are not vulnerable. Okay? We think, well, I'm going and I'm moving ahead, so that means that I am safe. And yet it is possible to become so focused that we miss the attack of the enemy and we set ourselves up. Think of it like a battlefield, because it is. Uh, and on a battlefield, if you're focused on your own maneuvers and you fail to consider the advance of the enemy, you're going to lose the battle. Okay? And so we are going this morning to lift the veil uh, and take a peek at the tactics of our enemy. Scripture is, has everything we need to be equipped to, as Paul says to Timothy, wage a good warfare. Okay? And one of the ways that it does that is it tells us the tactics of our enemy. Right? It's, it's, the, it's the greatest battle plan ever because it not only tells us what we need to do for victory, it tells us exactly what the enemy is going to do. So we know how to fight. Now, Paul here, we don't know if he gets to focus or what exactly happens or what opportunity the enemy saw. What we know is Paul sends away his supporters in verse 22. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. Now, remember back in chapter 18, we saw that Paul comes to Corinth and he is in fear and he is only strengthened by the arrival of Silas and Timothy. Now Paul is sending them away. There's a very specific wording here. It says they ministered to Paul. All of us need support. Right? It's, it's a very safe thing to say that if Paul needed support, he needed people to minister to them, so do we. Jesus had people who supported and ministered to him. So we need that as well. And this is what Paul had in Timothy and Erastus. And it is after Paul sends them away that the enemy strikes. Okay? Now here is our lesson. Satan will always attack those who are isolated. Satan will always attack those who are isolated. Isolation, we think to ourselves that that is where we're going to find safety, right? Because then no one can hurt me. That's what we say, right? I've been hurt, I'm going to isolate myself so no one can hurt me. That is the most foolish thing we could ever do because in isolation, Satan attacks. Right? And so Satan attacks Paul. Now, I, I, please understand, I'm not saying that what Paul's doing here is wrong. I'm using it as an example that there are times when Satan is going to attack. There's times when it's necessary to be alone, right? When we don't have a choice, okay? However, when that takes place, it doesn't mean we still don't have support. 
Okay? We will see later that Paul does still have companions. They're, they're not called ministers, but travel companions. What we need is we need close, intimate fellowship to help us navigate the Christian life. The church is called what? The what of Christ? The body of Christ. For, and it's called that for a reason, because we're su to support and strengthen one another. So we have to be aware of the tactics of Satan. To help counter this attack, we have to have a plan in place. What do I mean? What I mean is, when, when a moment comes that you have to be alone, have people you can call when Satan attacks. Have people who can support you. Have a support system in place so that we can resist and stand against this attack of Satan. So Satan attacks when we are without support, when we are vulnerable because we are isolated. Secondly, when successful, we are vulnerable. When successful, we are vulnerable. Look at verse 23. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. I, the phrase about that time is so interesting to me. Um, Satan knows exactly when to attack us, okay? As soon as Paul sends his main supporters away, Satan's right there, okay? There's this great commotion about the way. The way um, is how Christians were known at that point in history. It came about because of what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so they called themselves the followers of the way, okay? And they just became known as the way. This commotion is essentially a disturbance or a tumult Luke is telling us here what happens in broad terms by way of introduction, and then he's going to give us the details as we move forward. When we follow Christ, the way that Scripture describes and demands, it will cause a commotion. Okay? What are the disciples doing? They're not doing anything radical. They're preaching the gospel. And there's this commotion, this tumult that arises. Why? Because they're being faithful. Folks, in our day and age, as we see the world around us get increasingly darker, us living the way Christ has told us to live is going to cause commotion and tumult. It already is in many places. Re look at verse 24. For, so now he's telling us why, a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, or Artemis, depending on your translation, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. So here's the reason, the source of the commotion. And this whole passage is evidence of the blindness and the bondage that Satan puts people in. Okay? This whole passage is evidence of that. This man was a craftsman. He's this skilled metallurgist. He creates idols. Okay? Now, we can kind of already see why there's a conflict between him and Paul. Right? You have Paul, the proclaimer of Christ, and this guy who makes false idols. But the end of the verse gives us some insight into Demetrius' true motivation. Right? He's making money off of this. Right? He's making money off of it. So from this little bit of insight, it seems clear that he is more concerned about the money than he is about their false God. Okay? When we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, lives are changed. Okay? In this transformation of lives, customers to ungodly businesses are lost. Does that make sense? Okay? This loss of revenue is part of what makes Christians a target. That's what we're seeing right here. In fact, um, actually I think I have that quote, so... I'll get that in a second. Uh, so the, the, their livelihood is bound up in this. One of a, the prime examples would be the abortion industry. As we lead people to Christ and they move away from things like abortion, it threatens the, the livelihood of that industry. That's why they get so up in arms, because it's about money. Okay? And that's one of the main sources of their opposition. Look at verse 25. There, there's a lot of other in industries like that, by the way. Uh, ungodly, sinful industries that when we lead people to Christ, they leave those industries and people get upset because we're taking their customers. <laughs> Look at verse 25. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. So he calls in uh, backup, right? And, and they have their livelihoods. He's saying, and, and the, the wording here is that they're not just making uh, ends meet here. They are um, wealthy. They're getting wealthy 
off of this trade because um, people came, this is one of the seven wonders of the world, this temple to Artemis or Diana. People were coming from all over the world to come there and they would make these little miniatures of the goddess Diana and they would sell them to tourists. Now, if you've ever gone anywhere and shopped for anything as a tourist, you know that the prices are high, right? So they're making a profit off of these people. It's a good business. And now that business is being threatened. The only other protest by Gentiles against the gospel that Luke recorded in Acts also resulted from financial loss uh, in chapter 16. The profit, the profit motive still opposes the spread of the gospel. In chapter 16, the, the, um, Paul heals this girl who was bringing much profit to her masters with her soothsaying or her fortune telling, right? And they get all upset, not because he healed the girl, but because they lost their money. Money is a powerful motivation and it leads to persecution of believers when lives are changed and transformed. Look at verse 26. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Now here's a rare moment where we get to see uh, a description of Christianity from an unbeliever and how effective Christianity is. He says, he's, re he's reached all of Ephesus and almost all of Asia. And we're like, hallelujah, right? Even an unbelieving maker of idols knows that Paul's ministry had impacted almost all of Asia. That's awesome. Notice the language used. It's an accusation. He says, Paul has persuaded and turned them away, right? This is a targeted attack. They want to silence Paul. Why? Because he's teaching that these small-scale representations that they make, as well as the bigger idols that they fashion, are not gods. <laughs> Something made by man's hands cannot be a god. Isaiah has a great description of this, and we'll turn there. Isaiah 44, if you're using our pew hymnal, it's page 835 down at the bottom. Isaiah 44, and verses 14 to 17. Isaiah shows us the ridiculousness of serving an idol that you have made. <laughs> Isaiah 44, beginning in verse 14. Isaiah 44, verse 14, right after Psalms and Proverbs, and, and one other book, <laughs> 14, Isaiah 40, 44, verse 14. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak, he secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn. For he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half he eats meat. He roasts a, bo ro roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it, and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. I saw a great meme just this morning. I should have saved it to share with you. Um, it's this picture of this guy eating apples from this tree, right? And then he takes out his ax and he cuts down the tree and he builds it into an idol and he bows down before it and prays for pears. That's the foolishness that Isaiah is addressing. This person cuts down a tree. He takes some of it and he uh, cooks with it. He takes some of it and he... Uh, warms himself with it and then he takes some of it and he makes a God and he says, deliver me. Paul says to these people in Ephesus, if you make a God with your own hands, it's not a God. Might be a cool statue at best. Usually their gods were kind of creepy, but that's just my opinion. Paul is absolutely right to state that things made by the hands of men cannot be gods. You just made it. How can it save you? How can it deliver you? Scripture also says they have eyes, they don't speak. They have ears, they don't hear. They have hands, they don't handle. They have feet, they don't move. You have to pick it up and carry it from place to place. How is that a God? Next week, we're going to celebrate that we serve a risen Savior. Active, involved, working. Now go back to Acts chapter 19, look at verse 27. 
So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Demetrius is a salesman. I mean, he is painting this in the worst possible terms. According to him, it's not just their trade being threatened, but the worship of their goddess. Again, this is one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, right? There was no danger, really, of people leaving it. Now, I wish we could say, absolutely, they were in peril of losing their goddess. Um, but I don't know that that actually is true. Demetrius is playing on their loyalty to their city, to their goddess, and to their bank account. Okay? Now, notice how he overestimates the importance of what is taking place. He says the temple is going to be despised. Her magnificence is going to be destroyed. Their trade is going to end. Uh, we see these same kinds of attacks against Christians today. They overblow what is, what is taking place. Blow it out of proportion. This attack on Paul is coming at a time of great success. Why do I say that? Because Paul has, as he said, persuaded people to turn from their false gods. All throughout Ephesus and the whole of Asia, people are turning to the Lord. We just saw that people came and they, offered, they, they burned their books of magic and it was m the equivalent of millions of dollars. Right? So hearts are being transformed. Lives are being transformed. People are being saved. This is when Satan attacks. Think of Elijah. Mountaintop experience, Mount Carmel, awesome, runs for his life, deep depression. Right. Satan attacks when we're experiencing success. Paul's success in, in evangelism here leads into this persecution. And so here's our lesson. Success can lower defenses, leaving us vulnerable. Success can lower defenses, leaving us vulnerable. So what do we do? We keep our guard up. Okay? Uh, <laughs> don't wonder, uh, maybe Satan might attack. No, plan and prepare as if Satan will attack because then when he does, you're ready. Okay? There is never a time when we can let down our guard. I wish there was. I wish I could tell you, uh, you know, on this day and time, schedule it and you can have spiritual downtime and just let it all hang out and, and be fine. No, we can never let down our guard. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking those moments when we are vulnerable so he can devour. When does Satan attack? When we're without support? When we are experiencing success? Because we know this, we can prepare. Always have a support system. If you can't be physically with someone, have a, have a plan in place to contact someone at a moment's notice. When success is a reality, remember it is God who accomplishes these things in us and through us. So that is when Satan attacks. Now we're going to look at how Satan attacks. And the first way we learn in our passage is Satan attacks through the blind. Satan attacks through the blind. Not physically blind, spiritually blind. In 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, we learn that Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers to keep them from Christ. How does he blind people? You know, Satan is all about counterfeits. He takes the good and the righteous things that God has made and he twists them. He's been doing it ever since the garden. What he offers to keep people blind is counterfeit religion. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning. He gives them counterfeits. Oh, they worship something. They believe in something, but it's a counterfeit. That is what idolatry is. It is Satan's counterfeit to God. Once Satan has trapped people into false religions, he uses them to attack those who believe the truth. And in this passage, what we see is an attack orchestrated by Satan using people who are blinded by their counterfeit religion. And as they attack, we learn two important things about them. First, we learn that the blind are passionate. The blind are passionate. Look at verse 28. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! All this wrath is coming from a what if by Demetrius. What if all these horrible things happen? <gasps> Great is Diana of the Ephesians! They've been deceived. And yet they're passionate about the defense of their own deception. 
passion and a catchy saying don't make you right. I wish our world could understand this. Passion and a good catchphrase doesn't make you right. These people are passionate. Great as Diana of the Ephesians. They got a good catchphrase, but they're lost. We need to carefully evaluate groups before we join them. <laughs> By the way, don't just join any group because they're passionate. Make sure that they know the truth. Don't join a group because they got a good catchphrase. Make sure it's someone who aligns with what we believe. Look at verse 29. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. The word confusion could be translated turmoil. Demetrius has caused a riot. Okay? And so many people in the city rushed to the theater. This, they, we, they have actually found the remains of this theater in Ephesus. And so this is the reconstruction of what the theater would have looked like. So down here you have the stage and you have all this seating and the rows to get down and the orchestra. They estimate 25,000 people fit in this stadium. And so when it says that the whole city was rushing in there, they probably filled this place. 25,000 people here. And as we mentioned earlier, they take in Paul's travel companions. They bring them in. Okay. Gaius and Aristarchus have come with Paul from Macedonia and they grab them and they bring them into this theater with them. Satan has so blinded the minds of these people that kidnapping innocent people and dragging them into a public trial seems reasonable to them. This is what the lies of the enemy do. They blind cities and nations and keep them in bondage to sin. And what we see here is that there is a cost to being a follower of Jesus Christ. Faithfulness to our calling will result in persecution and opposition. Does that mean that we shouldn't be faithful? No. But, you know the saying, forewarned is forearmed? That's what we're doing here. I'm warning so that we can be prepared. Knowing there will be opposition helps us to prepare for it. Look at verse 30. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. The disciples prevent Paul from going in. He wants to go, but they stop him. Two things about this that I think are really important. First of all, our care for others should make us willing to take risks. Paul wants to go in there. There are 25,000 people and Paul's like, hey, that's a crowd. I can, I can preach the gospel to that. And the disciples are like, eh, this might not be the time, Paul. Would we be willing to go into a theater with an angry, angry mob when we are the object of their fury? Secondly, the body of Christ needs to protect its own. <laughs> they prevent Paul from going in there because they know that if Paul were to go on that stage and say and start preaching, they would probably have killed him. We need to protect our own. We need to protect our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to protect our leaders in our churches. Look at verse 31. Then some of the officials of Asia who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. So Paul has made some friends with some of the officials. This is um, meaning officials of the whole area, the whole region, not just the city. They plead with him to stay away. God has allowed Paul's ministry to reach people in places of authority. And God now uses these people to protect Paul. That is the sovereign God that we serve. He is rewarding Paul's faithfulness. Paul didn't go looking for people. Paul didn't go, hey, that guy could probably get me out of trouble later. I'm going to share the gospel with him. No, that's not what Paul's doing. Okay? Paul is faithfully preaching the gospel and God is bringing people to himself and having them in positions that he can deliver his children through them. Okay? Why wouldn't they let Paul in? Look back at verse 26. <clears throat> Verse 26, moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people. So it's personal. They, they, they knew that Paul was one of the main preachers, and so they don't want Paul to go in there for fear of what might happen. 
These people are passionate, but they are passionate about the wrong thing. And again, we mentioned this in Sunday school. There's so many people that are very passionate in our world, but they're very passionate about the wrong thing. And we don't want to get caught up in that. Here, these people, their passion leads them to act in ways that are not only irrational, they're illegal. <laughs> and this is another thing that we see in our society. Those who have believed the lies of Satan defend their false religions with violence and anger. Satan uses misguided passions to keep these people in bondage and they're even breaking the law over these issues. It is up to us to use the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God to expose Satan's lies and then the Holy Spirit will use that to release them from their bondage. Why is Satan's, sorry, not why, what is Satan's goal in this attack? He wants Paul and the other believers to get discouraged. That's what he's going for here. If 25,000 people are in this theater yelling, great is Diana of the Ephesians, would that not be a little depressing? Man, I thought we were bringing people to Christ. I thought we were winning the city for the Lord, and now look at them. That's what Satan wants. He wants them to see this opposition, and he wants them to give up, and that is what he's doing in your life and mine. He wants us to see opposition, and he wants us to give up. Folks, that's what he's doing. He wants us to say, you know what? This Christian thing, it's not working out for me anymore. And I want something else that's easier. If he can keep the child of God discouraged and hopeless, he can keep us ineffective. Don't allow opposition to leave you defeated. Instead, recognize that opposition to ministry is God's stamp of approval. Well, how do we know that? Because he says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. When difficulty comes, when trial comes, it's God saying, you can handle this with my strength. God is our greatest, uh, not only our greatest cheerleader, he's carrying us across the finish line. Satan uses these blind people who are passionate to oppose the gospel. And he is trying to discourage the saints. Don't be discouraged. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. So these blind people are passionate, but secondly, we learn that the blind are played. The blind are played. Look at verse 32. <clears throat> some therefore crying, cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. I, I think a really simple good takeaway from this verse is don't get involved in a demonstration or a protest if you don't know what it's about. People had joined this mob. They have no idea what it's all about. Satan is playing them. He's deceiving them. We see this taking place in our country. People join protests. They go on marches knowing little or nothing about what the cause is they are marching for. And we dare not make that a mistake. This is happening, happens when we buy Satan's lies. It breeds confusion and chaos. This is the blindness and the confusion that we all face apart from Christ. And so as blind and confused, they deserve our compassion and careful witness. We don't go, those foolish unbelievers, how could they be so blind? Such were some of you and me, right? It should get, build compassion in us to witness to them. Look at verses 33 and 34. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice <clears throat> cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And on and on and on. I can't lie, my my first reaction to that is always to kind of chuckle. Alexander doesn't even have a chance to say anything. They find out he's a Jew, and for two hours they chant this. And so it, it makes me kind of laugh. 
until I remember they're doing it because they're blind and lost. They don't have any hope. Alexander was going to make a defense. This is where we get our English word apologetics from this Greek word translated defense. The implication here is that Alexander was fully capable of making a defense. So the question is, would we be willing and able to defend the gospel before a mob of angry opposition? Chanting for two hours is ridiculous, especially when we consider and remember that most of them have no idea why they're there. Satan has them in such bondage that they do this with no apparent hesitation. I can't imagine yelling anything for two hours straight. I mean, can you imagine? Great is John of Lockford. I mean, I'm bored after the first one, right? It's going to get old really fast. What is, what is Satan trying to do here? First is obvious, okay? The first one seems obvious. Satan is preventing the spread of the gospel. What do you think Alexander was planning to say in his defense? The gospel. So Satan is preventing the spread of the gospel by not even allowing Alexander to speak. No gospel presentation is given. The people are shouting too much for anything to get through to them. Make no mistake, this is still Satan's goal. He wants to silence the gospel. Okay. Second, Satan wants to create fear. I don't know about you, but if I was standing on a stage surrounded by 25,000 angry people chanting Great as Diana of the Ephesians for two hours, it would be pretty terrifying. I can't even imagine the spiritual oppression in this kind of a setting. You would be wondering how long it would be before words no longer suffice and they begin attacking. Fear is one of the biggest things that keeps us silent. There's a huge element of God's protection here. See, Satan wants to use our fear to keep us silent about the gospel. But the solution to fear is steadfast reliance upon our all-powerful God. <laughs> we have nothing to fear, right? What does Scripture say? If God is for us, who can be against us, right? Don't fear what man can do to you. <laughs> From this section, we learn that Satan will try to use people whose minds have been blinded to shut down the gospel and create fear in the child of God. He wants us discouraged. He wants us full of fear. These people are being used by Satan without their knowledge. They are being played. This is important to recognize. The people who instigate opposition are doing so because they are in bondage to sin and Satan. Never think that they are beyond the reach of God's grace. Let me say that again. Never think that they are beyond the reach of God's grace. No one is beyond God's grace. He saved Saul and made him Paul. And I think sometimes we gloss over that in our minds because we love Paul, but the man murdered Christians probably for years. But God saved him gloriously, completely, permanently transformed him and used him to spread the gospel. No one is beyond the reach of God's grace. This passage reveals to us a second way that Satan attacks. And in the end of the chapter, we learn that Satan attacks through injustice. Through injustice. In John 8, 44, Jesus refers to Satan as the father of lies. One of the ways in which he attacks the child of God is through deceit. Satan will use whatever tactics he, he finds to be most effective. And a very effective use of deceit is in our legal system. Okay? This is a method that is on the rise. Okay? Two areas of injustice are portrayed here. First, we find unjust accusation. Unjust accusation. Acts 19, verse 35. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus... What man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Thomas Constable writes that this uh, clerk is like a mayor. He was an elected official who was responsible for what took place in the city. So he has a vested interest in quieting this riot. Right? 
right? Because his job could be on the line. He quiets them down and he gets them to think. Where Demetrius inflamed them, this man calms them. Demetrius spoke to incite anger and raise a mob. The clerk uses logic and reason to disperse them. He talks about an image that fell down from Zeus or from heaven. It was a meteorite that came down. They said, oh, it's in the shape of a woman, and they started worshiping it. Okay? That is what they would make images of. <laughs> The fact that these people believe Zeus sent down an image for them to worship requires a great deal of faith. Again, we talked about this in Sunday school, but we must never forget that false religions take faith. And so we cannot mock or belittle their, their religions. What we must do is show the superiority of our faith and its object. What is the object of our faith? Christ. Took us a second, right? So I'll ask it again. What is the object of our faith? Christ, okay? Not a meteorite, not an idol, not a book, but a person, Jesus Christ. Next week is all about why he is our hope, okay? This is what Alexander was prepared to do in verse 33. He was going to give a defense. 1 Peter 3.15 uh, talks about this. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's what Alexander was going to do. He was going to give a defense. Willingness to give a defense is not enough. We must also be able to give a defense. That means that we must be equipped to defend the faith whenever we are asked. Not just willing, but able. Okay. Look at verse 36. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. Uh, it almost seems like the clerk is giving the mob advice on how to better oppose the gospel. Uh, that's the impression I get. Um, perhaps that's what he's doing. We don't know. Regardless, he advocates for the mob to consider what they're doing to stop the chant, to stop the disruption, because there's no way the goddess can be denied. Okay? Look at verse 37. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Okay? Uh, the innocence of Paul's traveling companions is affirmed. Okay? He says they're, they're not guilty. And I don't believe that hearing this makes Satan go, oh man, I'm going to give up. Okay? All he has to do is come up with a new accusation. Okay? This is what he does with us. He continually makes accusations in an attempt to discourage and shut us up. Revelation 12.10 calls him the accuser of the brethren. Okay? His goal is to silence the gospel, to get the child of God to doubt that people can be reached. In an effort to do that, Satan brings accusations against us. So what do we do? What do we do when there are accusi accusations made against us? We prepare ahead of time. How do we do that? Live so that only accusations of faithfulness can be made against you. Right? Be like Daniel. What was the only accusation they could make about Daniel? Um, he praise all the time so let's get him right if that's the only accusation that can be made against you and me awesome be like jesus what was their only accusation against jesus well he is who he said he was how dare he right he, he's blaspheming he's claiming to be god well he is it's not a claim it's a fact right We claim to be followers of Christ. May that be the only accusation they can make against us. Well, they're, they're living like Jesus would. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> make sure that the accusations are false. Having failed in their current accusations, we can be confident there will be more to come. In, and in addition to their unjust accusations, we find unjust allegation. Okay? So accusation, allegation. Look at verse 38. <clears throat> Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. Here's why I think the, the clerk is actually kind of schooling them on what they need to do. Because he's telling him, look, bring a legal case, guys. Don't just start a mob riot. Bring a legal case 
against them. It seems the only way to take this verse is an invitation. He's inviting Demetrius and his tradesmen to file a lawsuit against Paul and his companions. Over the last decade or so, we have seen a huge rise in court cases being brought against Christians and Christian organizations in an effort to silence them. This is a tactic of Satan that we need to be prepared for. Again, we need to make sure that we're not suffering for doing wrong. <laughs> okay? I've heard people say, oh, well, I'm being persecuted for Christ because I'm reading my Bible at work. I'm like, yeah, you were reading your Bible at work while you were supposed to be working. You're not being persecuted for Christ. You're being persecuted for being lazy. Now, if you're reading your Bible on your lunchtime and, you're being, and, and they're bringing a court case against you, that we can talk about, right? Peter mentions in this, same, uh, this in the same passage we looked at earlier in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3, 16 and 17, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. <laughs> okay? Make sure the charges that they bring against you are actually false. Be the follower of Christ that you have been called to be and may that be what they're accusing you of. Don't let the allegations stick. Look at verse 39. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. He's saying, stop the mob violence and action here. Uh, if you have a legal complaint, make it legally. Uh, there are times when the law is our friend. Um, many cases are decided in favor of Christians in our country because of our constitution. So the law here in the United States is actually our friend, the, right, the law rightly interpreted. But there are other nations that it's, that's not the case. Look at verse 40. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. Here's the motivation. Okay? He's, he's worried about his job. Okay? There's this possibility that they could get into trouble. It called into question is there could be legal action taken against them because of this whole big explosion, right? Because they don't have an approved reason for doing what they're doing. So the special privileges they enjoy as a city with a temple and a center for trade are in danger because of their actions. And this is what God uses here to deliver his people. I love that. God's using this situation to deliver them. Look at verse 41. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Okay? Without Paul or the others, none of the Christians have said anything. They haven't done anything and the mob is dispersed. That is the power and protection of God. God, our sovereign God, takes care of his children. Satan has another tactic, and that is to bring legal action against the child of God. Here's what we have to understand. Legal action against the child of God is not more than God can handle. When they file a lawsuit against us, God doesn't go, oh man, what am I going to do? God can handle it. I know of a church right now that's in a frivolous lawsuit, and here's what I will tell you. God will handle it for his glory, in his way, in his timing. God will handle it. Though Satan actively works against us, the God of eternity is on our side. Please don't forget that. <laughs> the God of eternity is on your side. And so... A life above reproach is the greatest defense. The goal is for people, that, them, them to say, well, have you seen what this person is doing? And everyone around you to be like, do you actually know them? Because what you're saying doesn't fit at all. That's the kind of people we're supposed to be. This kind of a life can only be lived through the power of the Holy Spirit. Satan is going to bring cases against us. Jesus warned us that this would happen. But he also gave us hope for when it does happen. Matthew 10, 18 to 20. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of, the Father, of your Father who speaks in you. Now we need to be very careful here. Because the Holy Spirit cannot shoot an empty gun. How do we load the gun for the Holy Spirit to shoot? The Word. 
Now, if you don't like guns, let me give you a different illustration. The Holy Spirit cannot use what is not here. Okay? He's going to bring things to mind for us to say. If we've never hidden God's word in our heart, so to speak, if we've never memorized scripture, if we've not been feeding on the word, he's not going to have anything to use. Okay? He will bring things to mind. He will speak through us if we've prepared by being in the word of God. So we prepare for these moments by taking in the word so that the Holy Spirit has something to work with. As we wrap this up, here's, here's a, a few things to remember. First, we have an enemy. Okay? We have an enemy. Where the church grows, Satan attacks. Beloved, our church is growing. Be ready. Satan is going to attack. He's going to attack us individually. He's going to attack us corporately. Um, I think he already is. <laughs> We have things that break around here on a pretty regular basis. I don't think they do that on their own. Secondly, Satan wants to silence you. Satan wants to silence you. Don't let him. Don't give in to fear and uncertainty. Tr uncertainty. Trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. And know how to counter, counter Satan's attacks. How do we avoid fear and discouragement? To escape fear, recognize the sovereignty and activity of God. The Christians do nothing and say nothing in this instance. God uses the officials. Our God can do anything. He can deliver you from anything. To escape discouragement, know the word. <laughs> know the word. How does the word help us to escape in discouragement? In due season, you shall reap if you don't faint. The harvest is coming, but it comes at the end. When we are isolated, Satan attacks. Therefore, have a good support system. When we are successful, Satan attacks. Therefore, expect opposition and always give God the glory. The only way to defeat the attacks of Satan is through God's power operating in us through the Holy Spirit. Okay? So when the enemy strikes, three things, three things, and then we're done. When the enemy strikes, have an intimate relationship with God. Have an intimate relationship with God. When the enemy strikes, have a support system of trusted believers. Have a support system of trusted believers. When the enemy strikes, look for an opportunity to share Christ. Some of Paul's greatest witnessing opportunities are because he gets arrested. And we're going to see some really cool ones in the months, weeks, possibly years ahead. We'll see how the rest of the book of Acts goes. In our closing song, we're going to be reminded of who our God is and of how awesome his power is. But first, we're going to pray. Let's pray. Father, we have an enemy our enemy is smart, he is organized, and he is opposing us. You have given us the tools to resist. May we do that. Father, I pray that we would have an intimate relationship with you. That we would submit, yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. That we would have a support system of trusted believers and that we would look for opportunities to share Christ. I pray, Father, that this week everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think would bring praise and honor and glory to you and your name. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.